Welcome to the ongoing uh, webinar on uh, sponsored by the Safety and Security Committee of WEAT. Today's topic will be Can ha Hackers Be Stopped? And uh, we have a couple of uh, really great presenters today along with a panel discussion at the end. This is an ongoing series of webinars that the WEAT Safety and Security Committee will be uh, providing throughout the year. And we'll go into a little bit more details uh, a little bit later in the presentation. My name is Rick Hidalgo and I am the co-chair of the WEAT Safety and Security Committee. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, and uh, also, before we go too far, I'd like to introduce Julie Nargong, the Executive Director of WEED. Uh, she's going to go over a couple of housekeeping issues. Julie? Hi. Thanks, Rick. Uh, this webinar has been approved for 1.5 hours of CEU credit through the TCEQ. If you're an A or B level operator and would like to receive credit, please answer this survey you'll receive after the webinar in a follow-up email. Or, alternatively, you can also download, print, scan in, and send the CEU credit general questions uh, found at www.wheat.org slash um, cybersecuritywebinar.shtml. Please send the completed questions uh, form to julie at wheat.org. And uh, the URL shown at the bottom of your splash screen um, uh, allows you to access those general questions and a multi-viewer uh, site sign-in sheet. Um, please print off the sign-in sheet found at the same URL and mail it back, email it back to julietweet.org with your CEU credit form. All four questions found on the CEU credit form will be addressed during the webinar and the Q&A session. If you have any questions regarding the CEUs, please email julietweet.org or call 512-693-0060. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Julie. And uh, again, thank you for all your efforts to help us put these webinars together. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, today we have two distinguished speakers, Stephen Bullitt, Vice President of NTT Security, and Daryl Casada, a Director of Sales for Fat Pipe Networks. Uh, they will be both both be presenting uh, on. Uh, oops, we lost the slideshow, Julie. Um, Stephen will be presenting on the current state of cyber risk, and then Daryl's going to uh, present on IT security in the real world. Uh, as a form of introduction, uh, Stephen began his career as a special agent with the United States Secret Service in July of 1995, and over the next 20 years served in various capacities within that organization, inclusive of the presidential production detail for Presidents Clinton and Bush, as well as program manager for the Secret Service's Electronic Crime Special Agent Program. Later in January of 2010, he was selected as a supervisor for the Dallas Field Office for the North Texas Electronic Crimes Task Force, where he oversaw all U.S. Secret Service cyber and criminal investigations throughout Northern Texas. After a long and distinguished government career, Stephen now serves as Vice President of NTT Security's Cyber Forensics and Investigations, where he brings his unique government perspective to lead client-facing threat responses, forensic initiatives, and provides expert public com commentary on the state of cyber criminal affairs. Stephen holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Texas at Dallas and a Master's degree in Forensic Science Computer Fraud Investigation from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Our second speaker is going to be Daryl Casada. Uh, Daryl is the Director of Sales for Fat Pipe Networks, which is an OEM manufacturer of software for network security, disaster recovery, business cont continuity, and network connectivity. In that role, he consults with businesses to implement network solutions that maximize their investments. Daryl has been in online technology and marketing since 2006 and has had the uh, privilege of working with companies such as AT&T uh, and Hibu and clients such as the State of Utah, the Dallas Cowboys, the State of Connecticut, and the White House. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen. Um, Julie, if you could transition the screen over to Stephen. And again, thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. Great. Can you see me? Great. Great. Thank you. And can everybody see my screen? Yes, Stephen. Looks good. Stephen's coming through fine. Great. Great. 
And thank you, and thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the Water Environment Association of Texas for giving me this opportunity to discuss cyber threats that we are facing today. I guess the topic of this webinar is, can hackers be stopped? Is cybercrime industrial control systems biggest problem? Is there a difference across the various verticals? Who really has a structural advantage? Is it, the, is it our adversaries or do we have it because we should know our system better than they do? I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of mitigation, remediation tactics, as well as how do we stop them, plus provide you with a few key uh, takeaways. In today's water utilities, we see a great benefit from technological advances and automation. SCADA systems, PLCs, RTUs, single phaser technology, this all helps to sort of maximize our resources, conserve energy, mo uh, monitor operations, and track trends. But unlike other systems that are connected to the Internet, if they are sort of attacked, they can simply put up another image and get back to business as normal. If there's an attack on the water utilities, it could certainly have physical consequences. And so that sort of leads to the, to the overall problem that we're facing today. We know that the U.S. is the most heavily attacked country in the world. According to the United Nations, uh, the number of mobile broadband subscribers will approach approximately 70% of the world's total population. Uh, they say that the number of devices connected to the Internet uh, by the year 2020 will be six to one. There's sort of an explosion in connectivity. In many countries, that explosion of global connectivity comes at a time of economic and demographic sort of transformation with rising income disparities, tightening of budget sector spending, uh, private sector spending, and reduced financial liquidity which only magnifies the problem. If you look at what some of the our leading experts from the Director of National Intelligence, FBI, Department of Homeland Security are saying that cybersecurity is the top threat facing businesses and critical infrastructure in the United States today. If you look at what's in the news, whether it's the Dyne attack recently, DDoS attack, the NSA tool leaks, the Yahoo breach, the DNC uh, attack, which was related to Russia. You know, all these attacks, I always say that, are you a target of choice or a target of opportunity? And I think most companies are a target of opportunity. But whether it's a nation state, uh, a cyber criminals, or just hacktivists, depending on the cyber criminals' objectives, uh, their plans of attacks will vary. And when you look at the water utilities moving online, the hackers are taking notice. You have, according to the EPA, they look at the attacks on water systems as no different than any other uh, uh, vertical, whether it's a denial of service attack, uh, Trojans to be aware of, viruses, worms, snippers, key loggers, botnets, it's pretty much the same across the various verticals. So when you look at the targeted attacks across the verticals, when you look at the 16 critical infrastructure sectors designated by DHS, or if you take in the fact that um, whether it's retail, food and beverage, hospitality, technology, still the primary motive of most cyber criminals is financial, but you can see that they're diversifying their tactics, techniques, and procedures, and they're changing these to adjust to various data and devices. It's no longer just credit cards anymore. A few years ago, uh, the Department of Homeland Security put out a, an awareness bulletin basically stating if you're connected, you're likely infected. And they basically did this to bring awareness to the industrial control industry stating that if you do not connect uh, with a properly implemented security controls, uh, you're at risk. And just to bring that awareness out, 
and it sort of heightens the situation that we're in if you really look at from a convergence standpoint. We have a convergence of operational technology conversion with information technology. Initially, industrial control systems had little resemblance to traditional informational technology. Uh, industrial control systems were isolated, running proprietary protocols, hardware and software, physically secured and not connected to IT networks, and mainly managed and ran by mechanical engineers. Well, now that sort of change. You have software engineers that are involved. You have, you're forced to use sort of off-the-shelf, commercial off-the-shelf technology. Sort of low-cost IP devices are replacing proprietary solutions. So who really has uh, the structural advantage? We know for a fact that, unfortunately, cybercrime is not officially recognized in many countries. There's a difference in international, regional, and local policies. There's a lack of global coordination. We're sort of decentralized when it comes to coordination. There's a lack of information sharing and collaboration on a global scale. We do a pretty good job here in the U.S with our various information sharing and analysis centers and various forums like ICS, but it's a global problem and there has to be global solutions to it and there has to be global information sharing in order for it truly to be effective. Unfortunately, the cyber criminals have a very resilient and disposable sort of front end, uh, a disposable back end, but a very stable um, uh, a very stable back end, but a very disposable front end infrastructure. You can take down a command and control server very easily, but they can easily replace it and put it back up. I always say one of the key takeaways is something I heard from one of the security specialists out there, I believe it was Paul Bexy, who said, the internet's borderless, any security problems are borderless, and any solution must be borderless. When you look at the structural advantage that the criminals may have, you know, I, I talked about connectivity, um, profitability, sort of low risk, high reward. There's sort of no extradition treaties in countries like China and Russia. There's the principle of what they call dual criminality, where it's legal, illegal in one country, but not uh, illegal in another country, so it's very difficult to to capture and prosecute some of these individuals. You have anonymity with the layers of botnets and proxy web hosting servers and hijack web hosting servers that they use, let alone the dark web, which we won't even get into today. Uh, the attribution end of it with fast flux and things called domain generated algorithms where they're and domain shadowing, it's easy for them to constantly change who they are. And ubiquity, I always say ubiquity because it's pretty much everywhere. They understand our programming languages, whether it's C, C+, Ruby, ASP, Perl, PHP, or that which is in the industrial control systems, the, the different network topologies, connections, components, protocols they're starting to become more and more familiar with this type of technology. You know, and, and a big evidence of that is uh, if you look at sort of Shodan, Shodan is a, it's, it's not an anonymous raw search engine. It's publicly available. And if you look at a raw search engine like that, unlike Google, where it looks for a subset of all the servers, sort of web pages, websites, Shodan looks at everything else. It looks for devices. It looks for uh, mapping software, IP addresses, operating systems, versions, uh, various versions of applications. And it's and they're categorizing these things like industrial control systems, and it's available for people to see online. It shows exposure to default configuration and password vulnerabilities.
So let's look at sort of a real world case uh, advantage of example of how the adversaries have sort of their structural advantage. And in full disclosure, this is not an attack. This is an actual, I've looked at a lot of transnational investigations on a lot of big companies that were uh, exposed over the years. And this is just an example of one of them. And again, it's not in the water utilities in that sector, but it just gives you an example of what we're up against. You know, we were able in this particular case to trace the evidence back to a server hosted in California. When we actually went to the hosting facility to actually execute the warrant, uh, we wanted to find out information about the actual um, environment, who actually registered the actual server. And it was physically setting there, but virtually uh, controlled by another company. And we went to this company in California, and they said, it's physically setting here, but we don't own it. It's owned by a company. We're just a reseller, a company in Austin. We went to that company in Austin to find the information, the sort of subscriber information on this particular environment. Uh, they basically said, we don't own it either. We're just a reseller. So we, we said, who do we sell it to? They said a company in Poland. So we went to that company in Poland to figure out what they had, if they had any information on it. And they also said, we're a reseller as well. It was to a company in the Ukraine. So it just shows you uh, the way that they're using sort of our own infrastructure against us to sort of commit these crimes. And when you really look at, well, how bad is it? You know, like anything else, I look at a breach as, um, uh, these breaches are not, they don't happen in a vacuum. The adversaries must sort of interact with a compromised system. And when they do that, this process usually leaves behind trace evidence. So you have to think about it. If they're going to get into your system and interact with it, there is some trace evidence there. And if you're monitoring your system, you you should or will be able to, to find that trace evidence. You know, when I look back at, um, I was at a conference probably a, over a year ago, and uh, both the former heads of the National Security Agency were there one being General Alexander and the other one was Michael Hayden. And General Alexander has said that cybercrime is the greatest transfer of wealth in history, and that's something that he's publicly pushed out there. Uh, I found more striking was something that um, General Hayden said, and he said, folks, the cavalry's not coming. And it was pretty striking because what he's saying is, from the government side, if you're expecting the government to come in and pretty much take over and secure your system, that's not going to be the case. You know, the internet is pretty much owned by the private sector, and so it's up to us to protect our systems. And I sort of uh, reiterate back up what he says because running investigations with the U.S. Secret Service for most of my career and knowing what my counterparts over at the FBI are doing, and, and the FBI and the Secret Service are the two primary agencies that, for the most part, investigate these types of crimes. I, I truly believe what he says. Although very good intentions, the government is, is going to be there to help you to do mitigation and remediation for the most part, but um, it's up to us to protect our system. So how do we stop them? I think that if you really look at it, most of the things that we see are not overly sophisticated in the way that most of the bad actors or the adversaries get into our systems. For the most part, through a browser, a link, an attachment, scanning your system to find a vulnerability, social engineering, or an insider. I mean, not overly uh, sophisticated. If you look at some of the known malware that has been targeted, and this is just some information that's been publicly available, uh, targeting industrial control systems, you have Studnex, and it was written that it was a USB stick. Uh, you have Havix, uh, Sphere Phishing, Black Energy, which they say was a, uh, a person in, internally that downloaded a document. 
so not overly sophisticated in the way that they're attacking our systems. When you look at cybersecurity one-on-one, -on -one, what are the basics? And I always say the basics are, you know, having a process, a procedure that creates evidence as you go through a process. Have a framework, a standard, a best practice. Have something in place, an information security system in place to go through that process within your system. You know, conduct some sort of risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, compromise assessment, whatever you want to call it, but have a procedure that creates evidence as you go through the process. I think that's extremely important. Uh, during my time at the U.S. Secret Service, I, I wrote and authored several um, white papers and uh, advisories that I pushed out to the public, and one of them was cybersecurity for executives. And I only pushed this out there and wrote it because uh, I saw that, um, you know, when I would talk to various executives from different industries, that they would ask some of the basic questions, and so I put something together which sort of highlighted sort of five topics. And, and with that, it's what do you have that others may want? Where's your critical data located? Number three, what will happen if someone gets your data? Number four, where are you getting your intelligence from? And number five, basically, what are you going to do about it? And when I say all those, I'll, I'll go into detail on number one, what do you have that others want? And that's where you really look at your crown jewels. What is truly important to you within your system that if it's exposed would really cause problems? Whether it's confidential information, restricted, private, classified, what do you have that others may want? Uh, number two, where's your critical data located? And when I say that, it's very important to inventory your system, both physical devices and virtually how the data flows through your system, and that's inventorying data at rest, data in use, and data in motion. Uh, number three would be what will happen if someone gets your data? Is there some sort of regulatory violation? Are there any laws that are being violated? These are things that you really need to think about. Number four is where are you getting your intelligence from? You know, is it commercial, open source, underground government? You have to have some sort of way of staying informed about what's going on and, and knowing the current threat landscape. And number five, that's the big question. What are you going to do about it? You have to take some sort of action uh, to help your company out. So those are sort of the, the five steps that I tried to push off with, with that particular um, advisory. And there are plenty of other um, advisories and um, notifications that are out there, like this one from the NCAC, the DHS, which talks about the seven strategies to defend industrial control systems. Basically, hardening your perimeter is extremely important. Um, industrial Control Systems CERT, uh, their website has numerous um, recommended practices that you can go to and find information on things that you should probably do. Uh, I, I would like to leave you with a few of the basics, such as what can you do in, in just keeping it simple. For me, I think from a personal standpoint, think of your passphrase instead of a password. Uh, using air gapping whatever you can using a separate PC whenever you can for personal use and guarding your your personal information, your PII. I think that's extremely important in what you put out there over the internet and who you give that information to. You need to know what you have that others may want, what's truly important that would cause you heartache if it's given out to somebody else and identify those opportunities that you may be providing in protecting your own identity or information. Um, I, taking something from what Brian Krebs has pushed out on his website, if you don't need it, delete it, scale down. If you didn't install, if you don't install it, if you didn't go looking for it, and finally, if you did install it, make sure that you keep it up to date. When you look at some things to take away about what can you do about your network, I think that that's part of us being here is learning as much 
as we can about the possible risk uh, that we're exposed to, understanding the risks, threats, vulnerabilities that, that currently exist within your enterprise. You know, think about whitelisting um, instead of just um, uh, antivirus, AV. Regulate the traffic that enters and exits through your network. That's extremely important. And as I said before, inventorying your network is extremely important. Air gapping and network segmentation, extremely important. And these are just things that I've learned in working multiple investigations that I thought would have easily helped that company that was compromised. I'll finally just leave you with a few more key takeaways. There's a great divide between security and business. It's very difficult for security professionals to show value in getting funding uh, to help to, um, uh, to for providing uh, security for their actual company, to getting the key security professionals uh, to get the funding for it. And at times you can see where security professionals and businesses are not speaking the same language. One of sort of te technology, the other in a business context. Unfortunately, uh, security gets, often gets lost in translation. Uh, businesses invest in what they know and what they understand. And at times, security struggles to, to measure ways to sort of track the risk and influence business decisions. And I think that it's really important for you as a security professional, if that's what you, you're doing, is to show value to your organization in a meaningful way and to truly find and measure uh, and find ways to show visibility and measure and accountability for what you're doing. Uh, finally, if I leave you with just a few things that, you know, uh, I, I thought that um, this is really a good saying about, you know, changing the game. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. We have to think differently. We have to think out of the box. And again, the Internet's borderless. Its security problems are borderless. Any solution must be borderless. And we have to think beyond just here in the States, we have to look at a global scale. I want to thank you all for your time and um, I'll begin to turn this back over and I look forward to uh, answering any questions uh, during the uh, panelist session. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to turn it over to Daryl um, so that he can uh, present uh, from his standpoint. Daryl? Thank you very much, and thank you, members of, of WEED, for joining. Uh, this is Daryl Casado with FatPipe Networks. Hopefully, uh, we will uh, expand on uh, what this Steve was able to, to share with you um, using real-world real uh, cases and studies. Uh, we're going to hopefully be able to, to show you some common uh, remedies because as we've talked about can hackers be stopped uh, the answer is hackers cannot be stopped but they can be defended and so knowing what's what's being done in today's world for IT security uh, can be most helpful uh, in our discussion uh, my portion of the discussion hackers can be defended even though they can't be stopped we're going to discuss reported attacks and case studies uh, that have actually happened to identify the types of attacks, uh, the types of network security to defend those attacks, uh, the weaknesses that could you can be able to realize in your own network security, and then implementing plans to remedy the weaknesses, and what's out there in the way of network security that can help you defend against these hackers. The best way to describe uh, network security is the security we use for airline travel. In the last two decades, we've seen uh, security processes and procedures heightened and increased based upon the danger in air travel. And we have come to accept those, even though we accept those security process measures with some degree of, of, of uh, trepidation because of the inconvenience, uncomfortableness, and the delays that may cause the, uh, the amounts of, of traffic and crowds 
the time to do it, the personal screenings that happen. But we've accepted these because what's the alternative? Uh, and so to get by, we're we able to uh, we're able to get by with humor and jokes to help us to, to realize that in order to have a secure air travel, we must go through secure network uh, or screening procedures. So like that, network security is like safe airline travel. If we really want security in our network, if you really want your network to be confidential in its communication, the integrity of its sessions between users, and the availability to, to uh, authorized users, uh, you're going to have to implement security process procedures, and we've had to heighten those as the, the danger and measures of attacks have heightened. It means a little more inconvenience, a little more uncomfortableness within your security, a little more investment in cost, but like airline travel, what is the alternative? And so we're going to identify uh, case studies of attacks that have happened to see what were the weaknesses, what were the remedies, and what you can take uh, as, a, as a takeaway to help your network security. Uh, you may be interested to know that through June of 2016, there were f over 1,400 reported security breaches in the United States, which is why when you talk to any information technology leader or CIO, on their top of their list is always information security. In our discussions with, with corporations, large and small, it's usually in the top two or three. What's their top five IT concerns? Information security is either one, two, or three in every one of them. And this uh, report uh, really supports that fact that uh, in this uh, in this report of through June 2016, out of the 1,400 breaches, there were 56 million records exposed. 25% of those breaches targeted government, state, local, municipalities, and utilities, and more than a third of those breaches came from hackers trying to infiltrate systems. Hitting closer to home to to uh, utilities, uh, water authorities, uh, state and local. Uh, you're probably aware in 2011 of, of the uh, screenshots that were posted online to show the user interface to monitor and control the equipment at the water and sewer department for South Houston, Texas. And then in 2016, among the government, local, and utility breaches in Texas were these five that were identified. And you may know of some of them or, or all of them. In other words, your network is under attack. There really is no vertical, no industry, no business, no network, no geography that's immune to hackers. Knowing that, you must implement security uh, measures to defend that. And so how secure is your network? This case study you may be aware of, the Ukraine's power grid blackout in December 2015. It shut down the power for some 225,000 power customers. Attackers used stolen user credentials to remotely access and manipulate the industry control systems. So it was a password-based attack. What they were able to find uh, in investigating this attack were the causes were unsafe practices of protecting passwords and a weak authentication process for network access. So based on the causes, the remedies were apparent. To disable, to reset, or reduce the privileges for, for personnel, to expand the use of two-factor authentication and password vaults, which we'll discuss uh, a little bit later as well, and then proper password training. So how, how secure or what is your process for password implementation, its use and its reuse and its updating? Uh, these words of Chris Perillo uh, ring true. Passwords are like underwear. You don't let people see it. You should change it very often, and you shouldn't share it with strangers. That's an easy measure to implement within everybody's network, but as you can see, it can be most ineffective um, when it comes under attack. We're going to consider another breach study. This is a water treatment breach case study last year, and for for um, confidentiality, the name of the of this of the company, organization, and security was not released publicly. But many critical and uh, IT and operating functions ran on a single SCADA platform in this case study. The system ran the, the water district's valve and, and flow control application, manipulating hundreds of PLCs. The system also, though, contains sensitive confidential information, customer information, billing information, companies' financials. So investigating the breach, uh, reporters were able to find an unexplained pattern of valve and duct movements that had occurred over the previous two months. Uh, this, these movements had manipulated the PLCs to manage the amount of chemicals used to treat the water and affecting the water flow rate 
and it caused disruptions in the distribution of water. A, a uh, study of the internet traffic to this uh, network showed that hacker attacks had connected to its online payment system. They had exploited a vulnerability in the online payment system and used it to get into the company's web server, which then compromised the customer data. And using those same means that they found on the, on the uh, web server, they then were able to interface into the water district's valve and control application running on the same system. Fortunately, the, the, uh, uh, even though they were able to alter the amount of chemicals that went into the water supply, the system alerts helped the company to quickly identify and reverse the chemical and flow changes. So there wasn't a major disaster that would be widely reported on. So based on this case study, what were they able to find? Well, uh, the, uh, they identified uh, weaknesses, but from that came remedies to defend future attacks. And it involved their network security, their branch security, their web filtering, and their policy-based access control. The weaknesses they identified were that their SCADA systems were outdated. They had a lack of isolation of critical assets separating their online payment systems from their water control systems. They had weak authentication and password procedures. There was an inadequate monitoring of the activity and access to notice suspicious activity that they would have caught in, in those 60-day period. There was no policy-based access control to block the suspicious activity. And a lack of redundant connections to the mail and web servers that they could fail over or shut down when one carrier was compromised with, with such attacks. So based on the weaknesses, they were able to identify the remedies. They improved their monitoring and logging of the system activity. They improved their firewall and their network security rules and implemented policy-based rules to block out suspicious uh, entries. They implemented uh, email, web server, and filtering security software. They limited and disabled vendor access to the network. They implemented a higher degree of point-of-sale management tools. They enacted their password privilege procedures, uh, two-way authentication for their personnel and password rotation, expiration, and updates. They provided a second internet service carrier for redundancy and failover capabilities. So when one uh, attacks to carriers were noted, they could shut that down and still continue customer processes. And then they trained their individuals on password rotation. You probably have identified certain uh, of these features in your network saying, well, maybe I need to do this, maybe I need to do that, which is good. And if you've got that, that's, that's terrific. That's the whole point of these case studies. Because experience says two of the five breach trends, beach, the breaches that will be trending this year, two of the five will be password related as well as online payment system related. Experian recommends implementing a two-factor authentication to identify users, recommending companies uh, to account for the aftershock breaches in their incident response plans. Because what's happened is when passwords are breached, then there's the uh, aftershock, like an earthquake, where uh, those passwords are sold or distributed or, or redistributed to others, and they continue to use them. Payment systems is the other uh, one, uh, major breach trend of the five experiences will dominate this. It predicts uneven adoption of the technology, combining with attackers, targeting new industries, and adapting their tactics. So instead of targeting big name retailers, as we've seen, like Target and others, attackers will turn their attention to your network to see how well you can defend their attacks. So password and payment systems will be on the rise. What do you have in place to help defend that? Let's discuss some of the security software you can have in your network, the types. We're, really, the security software can be divided into two categories, internet security software and network security software. To define internet security software, this protects you against viruses, worms, spyware, mal malware, trojans, or internet files uh, written to do harm to your computers and networks. Uh, viruses and spyware can attack computers through opening infected email attachments, um, malicious links online masquerading as legitimate companies, um, emails saying they're from your bank or notes from your bank, even using logos similar to Visa and Amex to try to, to rope you in. Uh, viruses and spyware can attack your computers through infected files from web-based delivery companies like Dropbox or Google Docs. Through web surfing, as you visit, visit corrupt websites, um, undetected by you, the user, that worms are an example of this, uh, by opening macros application documents in Excel spreadsheets or Word documents. And as Stephen mentioned earlier, 
from USB supported devices, whether they're memory sticks, external hard drives, MP3 players, or even now CDs and DVDs. So there is internet security software to combat and defend this. Generally though, internet security software will not protect you against hackers, the kind of fraud or criminal activity that's not initiated by a virus. Uh, spam and phishing are not uh, protected by internet security software. Phishing is that term that was enacted back in 2000, around 1996 when hackers got, got into the AOL system for, to get usernames and passwords and uh, uh, credit card information. Phishing is that play on words of the analogy of actual phishing where you take a lure, like an email, as a lure and then if a user takes the bait, opens up the email, clicks on a malicious link in a seemingly legitimate email, then it breaks through it, uh, computer's defenses. So for these type of attacks, hackers, phishing, and spam, uh, you want to be able to look at network security software. Network security software will, will protect you and defend against activities that's not initiated by a virus, like hackers trying to break into your computer over the internet, trying to break into your system, flood your web servers, hack into your online payment system. So this software is available to provide that confidentiality, that integrity, and that availability. Also, there's additional software for a heightened level of security. Uh, for example, there's the providing private network security over internet connections. Back in 2001, our company developed a patented technology that the federal and government agencies wanted so that they could use internet connections like their private network in addition to their uh, main private network. Uh, software like this that's heightened helps to make it virtually impossible for hackers or intruders to trap your data and to decrypt confidential information. Uh, there's software out there to make your virtual private network or VPN secure to five nines. It's a very common catchphrase. Five nines just means 99.999% to do that. Let's identify some acronyms with network security software that will enable you to be a more informed buyer as well as defender of your network. We're going to discuss three acronyms here in this discussion. One is IDS or Intrusion Detection Security Software. This network security software can be likened, uh, we're going to use the, the airline and airport security as a uh, illustration. Uh, it does what it's supposed to do. It detects intrusion. So just as you're screened for your ID and, and uh, airline ticket to get access to the airline gates, if, they, if, they're, if your carry-on baggage is examined, that's what intrusion detection security software does. On a personal basis, it is software to monitor the activity in and out of your network. What's going in, what's going out, is it approved, is it not approved? But it does exactly what it's, it says, it's detection. It's act, you use that monitoring of activity to create policies, rules, limits, and restrictions for users and visitors. It is a detection system, much like the, the, uh, the commercial that has the, uh, the bank robbery in place and the, and the customer's lying on the floor looking at the guard saying, aren't you going to prevent the robbery? And he says, well, I'm a, mo I'm a robbery monitoring guard, not a robbery prevention guard. That's what intrusion detection service. So if, has, if the software is IDS, that's a good start. But what you want to be able to do, like airline security, is to prevent it. And so along with IDS, there's IPS. So it's network security, you want to see the, uh, the acronym IDS, but also IPS, which is intrusion prevention security. So once it's something that's compromised is found, it's removed. It's identified. It is isolated so that it is not part of the travel of, a, of, a, of, a, of an airline customer. That's the airport analogy. So in a network security analogy, hardware and software, that's network security, blocks entrance and access to your network based upon who the user is, where the source comes from, the visitor, where it's going to in your network, what's the content of the communication, and rules and policies and guidelines to detect this. So firewalls, routers, and security software are all part of network security. It's hardware and software, though, that needs to be configured properly. If you purchase it, don't assume that it's all ready to go. It's, even though it says plug and play, make sure 
that the hardware and software is is actually performing. So the, the, this rule of thumb, never assume it comes preloaded. Make sure when you enact it, enable it, uh, deploy it, that you have definite uh, proof that is actually uh, activated. So these are all types of, of network security software as you see here, IDS, IPS, spam filtering, antivirus, VPN, web filtering, mail server security. There's another acronym that we refer to as DDoS or Distributed Denial of Service. It's for networks that use online services for customers, online payment systems. So your network that has an online payment system, you need to identify what is your Distributed Denial of Service or DDoS uh, standards. Like in, in the airport, uh, you cannot flood uh, the, the TSA pr people. It's everybody is one at a time. And so they're going to deny service to mass groups. They're going to take each individual one uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So DDoS filters out unwanted messages and prevents the flooding of access to your network servers as hackers try to crash your server from overloading requests. They have uh, software out there, hackers, that will try to access your network server 70,000, 80,000, 100,000 times to try to, to have so many requests that will crash your server and, and leave it open for attack. DDoS takes care of that. Two more acronyms to remember are FIPS and FIPS 140-2. The entire TSA uh, security uh, arrangement and procedures, uh, use that as the guide because FIPS stands for the Federal Information Processing Standard. It's a U.S. government computer security standard. And FIPS 140-2 are products that are validated as conforming and accepted by the government computer security standard to provide protection for sensitive or valuable data. So just as a TSA approved procedure, FIPS 140-2, you want to make sure is your network security compliant or conforming to FIPS 140-2. Now the American Water Works Association's uh, tool mentioned here has a link. You'll be able to access this uh, and be able to see a prioritized list of recommended controls to see what uh, how compliant it is are your products you use to FIPS 140-2. Another type of security is web filtering, email filtering, and virus protection uh, that hackers try to use that internet security software doesn't provide. Web filtering and content filtering software provide the ability to restrict and log web access by various user groups. So in URL, we call it URL filtering, or software checks for the website name or IP address. If it's part of the blocked list that you put for the group, then access is denied. Obviously, that, that uh, group of, of uh, website addresses keeps growing as uh, reports are made of suspicious activity. So that's web filtering and content filtering. Uh, well, that's web filtering. Now, content filtering takes a step further than web filtering because content filtering looks into the content of the, de of the source of the web address. And it's based on characteristics like phrases, so it's word related for security. Uh, there's meme types, so if it's graphics or spreadsheets or pictures or images, and then virus or malware. So it looks into the actual content, opens up the, the session to see what words, what images are listed there. It screens the web page to see if some or all of it should be displayed to the user inside your network and provides for browsing tools to ensure adherence to your internet policies that your company provides. Then there's phishing and spam filters where fraudulent email messages appearing to come from legitimate companies are identified and, and quarantined. So it prevents you from uh, being tricked into clicking a malicious link in a seemingly legitimate email and therefore it will open your computer up to be broken through and, and defended and get into your system. This uh, phishing and spam filters are used to detect unsolicited, unwanted emails and prevent messages from getting to your inbox. Now back in December I sent a, uh, an email to, to Robert uh, Durham and his phishing and spam filtering was working because the email that you see here in the upper that I sent to him went to his spam folder here below that he identified. So his spam filter, his phishing filter was working because it must have had controls that identify images, as you see here, this image, and web links, this, this link and this link. So maybe his was so strong that any web link or any images or maybe the size of the image or the length of the link 
did not meet their standards. My email could not get through to him. It was in a spam filter. So that's an uh, uh, indication of is if your web filtering, if your spam filtering is working. Also, you want to look at network security that really can provide policy-based routing rules. Um, as you see here in the picture, make the, make the security software identified by this piece of equipment, ITTSA. Let it become your internet uh, uh, technologies uh, TSA network to identify, to screen, to qualify, quantify, and either allow or deny traffic coming into your network, to the users, to your printers, to your servers, to all that sensitive information based on policies. Make sure your network security has granular control of traffic routing to allow access in and out of your network with specific rules to allow or deny that access from users outside the network. Anticipate just like the TSA anticipates everyone is a threat coming into the gates. Uh, this network security assumes everyone's a hacker and so they have to pass those screening tests and have to follow the application rules that you set uh, as far as users, sites, and even sites that employees use inside your network to go outside for potential virus downloads that they bring in. Even rules to allow or limit bandwidth usage from uh, those denial of, of service attacks, those DDoS attacks that they try to, to, uh, to flood your network and break it down. And then virtual private network or VPN rules and policies for employees with remote access to your network, whether they're here from a, their laptop, from their home, and then vendor access to your network, which was the cause of one of the breaches that we mentioned in our case studies. So these are things to look for when you're looking at network security that can help your network, and then have a way of monitoring it so you can have a, a simplified uh, uh, visibility. There's, secure, there's software out there to give you one screen monitoring. If you have multiple locations for your networks, there's software out there to give you monitoring so you can see in any instant what's going on in each of your sites, uh, how the, how, uh, what are the sessions, what are the, what are the uh, uh, types of communications, and then you can identify those and then use those to see patterns and not have to wait 60 days out for suspicious activity to enact uh, policies and rules. So as a, as a review of the discussion that we've had, IT hardware, network security, internet security software should have some or all of these features. And uh, I'm not going to go into a long detail of all of these, but software should be your defense. It should be your TSA uh, for travel in and out of your network. The firewall should meet certain protocols uh, for DDoS protection and and uh, measure protocol security. If you have a private network, make sure that that encryption meets the standards. And if you have a private network connection as well as internet connections for your employees and users, make sure there's, a, there's encryption for the multiple paths as they go between private and public networks. Make sure you have web filtering in, in place to monitor and screen web pages and suspicious activity trying to access your network. If your firewall for your DDoS protection is cloud-based, if it's not on your, on your site but out in a cloud-based application, make sure it conforms to the same type of IPsec or Internet Protocol Security encryption. That's, that's your Internet TSA. So a, a, a well-informed network security is a well-defended network security to be, to be able to uh, lessen and defend yourself against the the, uh, the hackers that will continue to try to penetrate your security walls. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. This is Daryl Casada, and then I will um, now give the uh, program back to Julie. Okay, thanks, Daryl. Uh, next on the agenda for our uh, presentation today is going to be... We're going to go move into our panel discussion. Um, Robert Durham of Dataflow Systems will be moderating the panel discussion, and he'll introduce the panelists in a bit, but I wanted to introduce you to Robert first. Robert is the Regional Director of Business Development for Dataflow Systems Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Hardware and Software, and he covers a four-state area that includes Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, I'm sorry, five states, Arkansas, and New Mexico. Uh, he has over five, 35 years' experience and is responsible for key account management, as well as developing strong relationships with installation and service professionals for the ongoing sales, install, and service of the Dataflow Systems customer base. Uh, over the last several years, Robert has been an integral part of the Safety and Security Committee and has been one of our most active participants 
and he volunteered to to moderate this session and and uh, he along with Kyle Parks helped to coordinate this uh, this session so I want to thank him for that uh, so Robert let me turn it over to you now thank you very much Rick I want to uh, introduce you to a great panel we're not only going to have the uh, four people I'm going to include you see three of their names on your screen now but we've uh, got Kyle Parks in on our panel discussion as well as kind of a last minute ad uh, he was available and we weren't sure of that at the beginning but Daryl Engelbrecht uh, is one of our participants and he comes with a, a big background and works in the utility industry he's graduated from Texas A&M University he's got a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering um, he's enjoyed being a part of mentoring and training activities he now focuses on his grandchildren and he spent several years as an advisor for end use load characteristic models developed at the Electrical Power Research Institute. He serves also on the Weed Safety and Security Committee. Uh, he began his career at TXU and he worked as a project engineer on electrical distribution improvement projects. He moved into rates and regulatory and then he provided cost of service information for rates uh, before the Texas Public Utilities Commission. He led uh, customer class modeling for system load requirements and development of real-time generation planning centers and uh, he also used operational SCADA plant status current weather conditions in that operation. He led the development of TXU Energy's tra uh, trading master system repository for processing transactional and analytical applications using SCADA and he joined the water facility project management team in 2005 uh, with the replacement of the Elm Fork SCADA system. He's been involved in several other uh, project management roles uh, at different pump stations along the way all with very large systems uh, White Rock SCADA uh, also the Dallas Water Utilities Pumping Division where he currently works in the White Rock Control Center. In addition to Daryl Engelbrick, we also have Michael Campstra and Michael is the Director of Network Security Services for the San Antonio Water System. In his current role as Director of Network Security, he's responsible for providing leadership, strategic and tactical planning. Uh, he also oversees the SAWS Network Engineering, their Enterprise Security, IP telephony and the radio system. Michael's team is uh, 14 active employees. He began his work at SAWS as a network engineer. He was responsible for managing and engineering all aspects of the physical security department uh, and their outdoor wireless network. He's uh, done a number of other things and uh, been with uh, SAWS except for a period uh, slightly around uh, uh, in between 2013 and 15 where he left and then he came back and he accepted the role of director of network securities there. Our third participant is Robert McMichael. He's a PMP and a CBCP certified. Uh, Robert has worked with the private and public sector businesses for over four to six years. He has extensive uh, experience in information technology infrastructure initiatives. He was in the cable and broadcast television industries. He's worked in the oil and gas industries as well as uh, projects with banking, retail, security, and medical. He holds a BBA from Laterno University and uh, an MA from Webster University and he's currently pursuing his Master's of Information Assurance from Oklahoma State University and is uh, finishing up his Certified Information Systems Security Professional Certification. He's currently a Senior Project Manager at Tech Systems. And then Kyle Parks who's also uh, the co-chair uh, uh, co of this with Daryl and myself. Uh, proceeding putting this webinar together. Kyle is a security consultant with Delta Risk. Uh, it's a chart off company. He's a graduate of Southern Methodist University and the Lyle School of Engineering. Uh, Kyle has provided uh, strategic planning and development of exercise scenarios for industrial control systems within various SCADA environments. Uh, Kyle is also a newly commissioned officer in the Texas Air National Guard Combat Communication Squadron in Grand Prairie, Texas. And with that, um, those are our four panelists and we've got some questions but I want to point out that in the bottom of your screen as Julie did earlier you can submit your questions there so we'll be taking those as they come in and uh, passing those to the group and we, ha we have a couple here one that came in during the presentation and this one uh, is going to go back to Stephen Bullitt who was one of our presenters and Stephen you mentioned uh, forget AV and focus on or consider whitelisting instead uh, you know has some advantages so I just would like you to uh, let us know what your experience is there and whether or not uh, uh, people that you know have used this approach and how they've benefited from it. 
And basically, yeah, thank you. And basically, that was just a suggestion that I'm, I'm sure that uh, there are some AB products that are still uh, certainly viable and and we could find a lot of use in. It's just that when you're looking at narrowing your exposure and narrowing the risk, the gaps, you know, if you don't need uh, certain applications, then uh, why even use them? If you can whitelist and only allow those applications uh, those products that you need on your system uh, to execute, then that would be a, a suggestion. But again, AV has its, it has its uses, but with nowadays with all the polymorphic and changeable malware, a lot of times it's very difficult for AV systems to stop it, uh, to stop the malware from executing. So again, just a suggestion to sort of whitelist your applications to sort of shrink the risk. Thank you very much, Stephen, and I appreciate the clarification on that. Uh, we see a lot of information out there, and sometimes the acronyms can get overwhelming, so appreciate everybody using the real words. Uh, another question that kind of came in, uh, there was a lot of information from both of our presenters about password security. And then, but this one kind of addresses that, and I'll, uh, I'll just kind of ask over this to the panel uh, out there, the group, and just speak up if you have an answer here, and we'll, we'll sort that out. But we keep hearing about password security, but at 3 a.m. when you get a call, it's hard to remember a complicated password. Is there any way you could think of to make this easier on the operator on call? Absolutely. Using a passphrase or a sentence that's easy to remember is an easy way to remember complex passwords. So an example is pick something that you can easily remember. I found the one that was told to me and is appropriate for yesterday, be my Valentine. But the way you use that word, that phrase, and spell it or change things in it makes it more complex, correct? Exactly. We've got another. Yeah, OK. Oh, I'll try to be more specific with my pants. Go ahead. Is somebody else jumping in? Yeah, this is Kyle Parks. Another thing that, uh, besides the key phrases uh, that you could use, is also uh, key combinations on your uh, uh, your keyboard, right? So random key combinations. There's no, um, uh, you know, per se phrase or anything, but you know, just using uh, certain key combinations that uh, that you are familiar with, such as you know, uh, on your Android phone or something. You know, you have the touch uh, touch uh, type phrase or touch password uh, type phrase that you you randomly kind of generate. Uh, you could also use that same technique on your uh, keyboard as well. Just uh, just a thought. Thank you. We have another one here that uh, I guess we're seeing challenges in hardening of our security control system. So I guess. Uh, We'll put this one out there to uh, uh, Michael uh, Kamstra. What are some of the major challenges you see as far as hardening the security of your industrial control system, Michael? One of the biggest challenges that I see is that a lot of these systems are inherently insecure, and so they weren't really manufactured or designed with any security um, you know, configurations and design in mind. It was really designed to be more of an open type of system with a complete air gap from the rest of the network. So. Really what I'm seeing is the biggest challenge is just getting the manufacturers to start des designing and building um, more security controls into these devices so that they can be more secure, but um, also pushing the manufacturers to come out more rapidly with um, security patches and things that they've been validated. We're kind of at the mercy of a lot of our vendors to be able to apply certain you know, uh, patches to systems and change security controls on the systems because they have to validate and certify that those systems are compatible with those patches. So putting more emphasis on the industry to really drive security as a priority and not as an afterthought. Thank you very much. And also uh, to those that are uh, participating in the webinar, there are some questions in order to get your CEU uh, credits from the uh, uh, for your TCEQ licensing that you may want to know. We've got those on the screen. Um, we'll go ahead and read them though, just so that they're they're obvious to you. It's who coined the phrase "passwords are like underwear," and uh, this was in uh, earlier the second presentation. Actually, you don't let people see it; you should change it often. You shouldn't share it with strangers. And that answer is Chris Carrillo. And then there's another uh, second question. We need all four of these, so be sure you get them all down. What percentage of the information system security breaches 
documented through June of 2016, have targeted government, state, local municipalities, and or utilities. And that answer was 25%. And then there's another that says, um, should you ever click on attachments or links from unknown senders? Uh, the simple answer is no. Um, there's a recent uh, issue with that that released a lot of information in the public. Uh, what do the acronyms IDS and IPS stand for? The IDS is the Intrusion Detection Security, and the IPS is Intrusion Prevention Security. And from our presenter, uh, basically, you want both, uh, both of those. So the next question that we can uh, that we have here, and uh, Robert McMichael, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, currently, there's there are no governmental regulations requiring utilities to meet any level of cybersecurity protection um, from the utility standpoint. Do you think this might change in the future, or will it continue to be a voluntary system? You know, particularly we're interested in water and wastewater industry, but with your breadth of experience out there, what are you seeing? I haven't heard of any um, regulations that are indications that it could change. My personal feeling is is that it will have to change. I mean, we've heard over and over through this to answer the question, can hackers be stopped? And I think anything that we can do through regulations or through pr preparation, prevention, I guess is the word I'm looking for, is it will, it's going to take different measures to, to try to answer that question or change it to ideally, yes, we can stop hackers. Yeah, I'd Others like, to add, Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like Go ahead. to add something to that um, in uh, maybe not regulations, but there's other requirements uh, from the uh, bond issuers and insurance that uh, uh, we do our due diligence and make sure we have a secure system. So we do have pressure coming from other areas. Exactly. And as you, uh, from what I'm understanding too, as you go through your vulnerability assessments and your risk analysis, um, more and more things are, are coming up from that standpoint. I think we're going to consider in a future webinar talking about some of those specific things that you know, that put pressure on the utilities and, and, and just business in general to uh, introduce standards and do some of the things that we're facing right now that we need more help in sometimes. Um, we often hear that the answer to avoid being hacked, and, and Stephen Bullitt mentioned it a couple of times, they used the, the uh, term air gap, uh, is to disconnect from the control system from the internet completely. Uh, this takes away one of the best tools for remotely managing our system, it says. Is it possible to securely connect to the internet so operators can benefit from having remote access to their SCADA system? And uh, our two presenters both touched on this, so Stephen, give your thoughts on that and the air gapping comments that you made, and then Daryl, I'll let you follow up uh, because it seems like you talked a little bit more about ways to secure that. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is Stephen Bullitt. Yes, I, I, and again, I'll defer to, to Daryl on on the majority of the answers of this in regards to SCADA systems or uh, PLCs or RTUs. Uh, my point being uh, with air gapping is that uh, at times, unfortunately, when you're connected to the internet. There's a lot of public use. Uh, there's a lot of use for items such as uh, searching LinkedIn pages or Facebook or just exploring the internet. And if there's any way that you can take the personal end of it away from the business end of it and sort of air gap those two and making sure that um, uh, the technology or the connections from a business standpoint is only connected for business purposes, I think that that truly goes a long way to helping to hardening your perimeter. So um, again, I, I'll, when it comes to the actual uh, systems or the technology, I'll refer to, for, to Daryl for that. And Daryl, from uh, your perspective, dealing with not specifically the water and wastewater industry, but just general industries and businesses in general, you know, what, um, what do you see when you have two networks that are connected, but yet one has more security risk than the other? But they, there is connectivity between them. How can you protect uh, protect those networks, or can you? Uh, yes, you can. I identified there. We we actually uh, patented 
technology for the government. The uh, Southern Command, the FBI, uh, wanted a, a secure connection over internet connections for users outside their network. Uh, we actually have, um, there's two water districts in California, one in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that uses this uh, so they can use their public network as the secure network in concert with their private network. And so when users outside their 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 physical location log in, they have the encryption as if it's a private network. So there is technology out there and we've been using it for the last 15, 16 years. Thank you. And um, Daryl uh, Engelbrecht, um, I'm curious about the vendor Connection. Stephen Bullitt brought up in his presentation that, uh, or maybe it was Daryl Cassetta, brought up in his presentation about the access to the network through vendor access, and they restricted that. Um, what types of things are you seeing that are working, or things maybe even that you think uh, could be considered to, uh, you know, plug that hole? And uh, you know, what are you doing, uh, or what have you seen others do? Um, well, of course, we've got a, uh, a VPN virtual private network. Uh, that uh, is used. However, on the vendor side, they have uh, certain requirements that they have to meet. Uh, that includes uh, everything from uh, background checks to the equipment that they're using. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, a virtual um, unit that um, would be um, very isolated to be able to access our network. And then on our side, we have uh, firewalls that uh, monitor uh, only specific um, uh, entities coming in, and it's only open at that time that uh, we have uh, um, a need with the vendor. So there's no possible way of getting in unless the vendor has, uh, or we have a need for the vendor to get in. And then uh, the those activities have been monitored uh, on our system so that we can see uh, what steps that they took. And uh, their access is very limited uh, once they do get into our network. So that's a couple of different ways that uh, we're looking at it. Uh, of course, um, any um, any entity can uh, hacking entity can get in if they need to. But we're doing uh, what we feel is, uh, as far as the recommendations go, from security uh, from the security side. Thank you, and. Uh Michael Camster, I'm going to kind of throw this off to you too, because uh, in my experience as a vendor, I've had to get into multiple networks, and some are uh, better, uh, more difficult to get through than others. In some cases, uh, I have to use two-factor authentication in order to be able to get in, which I feel is a, is a wonderful tool because it comes back to me, and I know that they know that you know I'm the person that entered at that point. And again, back to Daryl. Engelbrecht's comment, you know, they monitor everything that goes on through that session. So what are you seeing out there as far as vendor access and how that should be, uh, how that should be handled or is, you know, what's your thoughts on it, I guess? Sure. So I'll kind of, you know, our environment is kind of similar to what Daryl had mentioned. We utilize um, Cisco VPN um, with uh, additional layers of security using um, the Cisco Identity Services Engine, Cisco ICE, if you will. And so when we create a vendor credential, we give them access to VPN into our environment, but it's very specific access to uh, one specific IP address, which is a jump box server um, that's running um, VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, that actually lives inside of a DMZ that kind of sits in between our corporate network and our SCADA network. So once they can VPN into our environment, they're able to launch this VDI session, which gets them into the uh, SCADA DMZ, and from there, they're also using another set of credentials to be able to get into the um, actual SCADA network to actually do any work on anything. So it's very tightly controlled. There are multiple sets of credentials they have to have. Um, and if they don't um, use those credentials within 90 days, their account expires. So we do have some lockout policies there as well. So it, it's very complicated, and, and we, we get a lot of calls on it. But unfortunately, we have to make sure it's secure. Actually. I think you're doing everything right. I mean, anybody that's going to get into the network should understand at this point that it shouldn't just be an easy process. Um, Kyle Parks, I w I'm curious, uh, assuming, you know, from your background working with people and doing the risk analysis, I know the things that you do, some of that, uh, assuming that the utility's done very little to date to protect their industrial control systems, what's the low-hanging fruit? I mean, what should they start with? Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, 
to me, the low-hanging uh, fruit uh, in what I've seen is simply the training, right? Talking to uh, your employees, talking to people uh, uh, within your organization, all the way up to the, you know, the director, all the way down to the boots on the ground. Uh, you know, what kind of what policies are in place for, you know, accessing, uh, you know, the SCADA system, whether it's the business network or the SCADA system, you know, per se. And it, to me, I mean, that's you, you can sit around a table and discuss these uh, these issues relatively cheap you don't have to I mean obviously it's just the time of the uh, the individuals there in place you don't have to get an outside in entity but it's just you know what are we seeing what are we doing if this happens um, you know hey are you aware of our, our new uh, password policy and hey by the way it expires every 30 days has everybody updated that or hey you know what we have an issue going on uh, with with the SCADA system um, at you know pump station A, you know what are what are what are we going to do to help uh, uh, remedy that and get it back online? And then what are we going to do to, uh, to uh, for the after action and follow up to see how how we can prevent that again? So really, it's the training and the discussion within the organizations that I feel again. Uh, you know, you have this emergent, uh, 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 emergence between the, the OT and the IT side of the house, um, and it's just again getting those organizations on the same uh, same playing field. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, we had one that came in for you. It seems like over the last several years there's been more and more instances of the reported attacks, you know, as you made clear, and uh, but yet many attacks go unreported. Do you see this trend continuing, or do you think that the increased emphasis on cybersecurity, uh, more will be willing to report the attacks and help others you know, gain information and learn from the lessons that they learn? Right. In my experience, I've seen where a lot of businesses don't report it because they don't have to. And if you don't have to, if there's no federal legislation that says you have to, and I know that that's been debated through Congress for a number of years, then a lot of companies do not because they're, they're not required to do that. Now, there are a lot of state notification and, and other regulatory um, notification procedures that have to go out, but until we have one I think um, nationwide policy to do that, I don't think that you're going to see an increase in companies that will start self-reporting. Uh, you do see, unfortunately, that a lot of the breaches are actually found by somebody else, and so that's how they're usually publicly disclosed, or the fact that they have to notify the actual victim of that particular crime, like the Yahoo breach. Uh, our, our, our the dying attack, which is of course um, you know caused uh, serious outages, um, and so when you have those third party or our third party victims that are actually exposed, they unfortunately you know businesses have to report that. But unless there's some sort of legislation, I don't see that changing. I think that from a business case, most companies tend to sort of close the ranks and try to remediate and mitigate the problem. That's a real world answer. Appreciate it. Uh, Michael, um, SAWS has extensive wireless networks, I believe, in their facilities. Um, what suggestions do you provide for to others for hardening your wireless networks? And then there's another kind of a follow-on question. Of what technologies are you using to improve securities regarding remote locations like lift stations uh, with you know, use wireless technology to communicate to them? Sure. So on the wireless technology side, it's really important that you use encryption on all your wireless links and try to use the strongest encryption possible. If you can get uh, AES-256 or better, that's a pretty strong encryption, so you're, you're pretty safe with that. Uh, make sure that you don't necessarily use the same radio IDs on all the radios in your network. So if you have a repeater, uh, multiple repeaters inside of your community, make sure that you're using different keys and things on those repeaters. So if one station gets compromised, it doesn't compromise the integrity of your entire wireless network. Uh, make sure that the credentials on those radios are not all the same. So again, so back to that, if you have an admin account, make sure that you have different credentials for each one of your repeaters. So I mean, back to that philosophy, if you get compromised on one, they can't take down your entire system. So really having multiple forms of authentication. Uh, we use uh, not only encryption on the radios, but we're also encrypting the traffic once it leaves those remote sites using um, VPN technology overlaying on top of our wireless technology. So if somebody were to be able to capture those packets, um, that traffic is encrypted as well. So it's very, very secure. 
but it, it's all, it all goes back to the physical security side of this as well. If your if your site itself is not secure and you don't have you know the proper fence and you know locks and cabinets and enclosures that are secure, you're really you know opening yourself up for compromise. And so we make sure that each one of our endpoints um, has the right level of security controls enabled, so it can't talk to anything else on the network. So if somebody were to compromise one of our stations, they can't. Um, remote access any of our other facilities through that endpoint. It's really locked down to only being able to talk to the HMI. Um, and there are firewalls between it and the HMI so we can make sure that the traffic coming in from the field over the wireless is, um, you know, acting and looking the way that it's supposed to look. So um, back to that, it's really all about the, the controls, not only from the, the network side of the house, but the physical side. And the two teams really need to work together to make sure that the right um, security is in place. Well, I thank uh, all of our panelists and participants for their answers. There's one fin final question I've got here, and I just have to plead my ignorance about not knowing all of the ISA standards by number. But there's a question about following the ISA 62443 security for ICS standards. Is there anybody that recognizes that and can talk about, um, you know, I guess the benefits of following that or, or anything you might be able to share with the group about ISA 62443. All right, Rick, we may have to put that on as a future topic to discuss. <laughs> I am going to uh, turn this over. Go ahead. Go ahead. Robert, 62443 is, is, uh, was formerly the ISA 99 Part 1. And for those that are familiar with the NIST guidelines, 800-53 is heavily based on ISA 99 and several other standards. Uh, so I guess the question is, have we followed that? In general, yes, we have. A lot of the utilities that we, we uh, Signature Automation, are working with uh, do follow the NIST guidelines and are looking to those as the basis for, for uh, securing their control system networks. And so I guess in a roundabout way, yes, uh, we are looking at it. ISA 62.443. All right. Well, that brings us pretty close to the close. So I want again, uh, Rick, I'm going to turn it back over to you and, and uh, Julie to wrap this up. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this session. And thank again uh, all our panelists, Daryl Engelbrick, Michael Kampstra, Robert McMichael, and Kyle Parks, as, as well as our presenters, uh, Stephen Bullitt and Daryl Caseda. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, again, this is Rick Hidalgo, uh, and I'd like to thank all the presenters as well, like Robert said, uh, on behalf of the Safety and Security Committee uh, for the great job they did, and, and also uh, give kudos to, to Robert, Kyle, and Daryl for pulling this, this program together today. Uh, for those of you that may remember, a couple of years ago, the Safety and Security Committee held uh, webinars every other month uh, throughout the year, and then last year we opted to do a, uh, a specialty seminar. Uh, this year we're going back to the webinar series, and we have several webinars we're planning. Uh, they will be on a bi-monthly basis on the third Wednesday of every month, so if you want to put that on your calendars. Uh, we're going to shift back and forth between safety topics and security topics. The next one we have scheduled is scheduled for April 19th. It'll be at the same time, 11.30 to 1, and the topic of that one is going to be active shooter. Uh, Jennifer Whitaker of the Trinity River Authority will be, uh, will be hosting that one. Uh, we are always looking for ideas on what you would like to hear about. So if you do have any suggestions on some topics you'd like us to cover in some of these webinars, uh, again, we have some preliminary topics lined up for the rest of the year, but if you have some, uh, we'll be glad to discuss them in our committee meetings and take that into consideration as we're planning these out uh, because we are trying to do these webinars for the benefit of you, the audience, uh, as uh, to answer some of the questions that you may be uh, curious about. So again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time. If you do have some suggestions, you can send those to Nyla Langford at nblangford at sig-auto.com, and uh, we'll get those incorporated into our committee meeting uh, discussions to see where we go from there. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Again, thank you for everybody's time.